All right, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is a series called uh, Wisdom Wednesdays. Uh, every Wednesday we're discussing a chapter from the book of Proverbs. And today we're going to discuss chapter 7. Uh, if you have not seen the uh, previous uh, uh, discussions of Proverbs, they're all uploaded on my YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch them there. Uh, but uh, I'm going to ask the panelists here just to introduce themselves briefly before we get started and uh, say hi and tell everybody the name of your channel. And uh, let's start with uh, Brother Bill. Yep, hello, I'm Bill, and uh, I'm the Panda Man Evangelist. And you can tell by my name, you know, I do like to evangelize, and I believe that's my, my calling. So, you know, we're not going to be able to obviously go through this, you know, Wisdom Wednesday without a little bit of evangelism at the end, because that's just what I do. So that's me. God bless. All right, thank you. Now, now Brother Eric? Hi, it's me, the homo, but you can call me Jim. And I love to evangelize as well. And uh, God bless you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Brother Sam. Maybe Sam's not there right now. Uh, Sam is. Hello. Okay, go ahead. Hello. This is Thick Shades. Uh, hope and pray everything's good. Um, the beginning, the fear of the wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, so says the good book. And, um, you know, today, again, we're going to go through uh, Proverbs, I believe. And I just pray that everyone will be edified and, uh, you know, get to know some more wisdom of God. Thank you, and God bless you. You got to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I uh, I hope that uh, anybody that's uh, watching the video, uh, please subscribe to uh, all of these channels, uh, and uh, you will you'll certainly be blessed by uh, their channels and uh, their fellowship with these, with these saints. Um, let's start right now with chapter seven, uh, verse one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read it in the KJV. Uh, and then uh, we'll discuss it, and then we'll read it also in the Amplified version, so that maybe by uh, amplifying the, the verse, uh, we'll get a little more information than we had in the KJV. Uh, okay, starting off, it says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the tablet of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth her, flattereth with her words. Uh, one thing that I will say about uh, Proverbs, I said this last time, and, and for those people who haven't studied the book of Proverbs, but you've read other books in the Bible, Proverbs is different because it's not a, uh, a continuous story. It's not a like a historical record and account of events. It's a, it's a, a list of sayings. Proverbs, a proverb is a saying. Uh, and and uh, uh, King Solomon wrote uh, most of it. I think some of it will be attributed to some other writer, but almost all of it was written by King Solomon. And he wrote the Proverbs, he says over and over again about the beginning of each chapter, he's addressing it to his son. He wants his son to learn to be wise so that there, in his life they'll be blessed. If you're wise, you'll, you'll have a better life. And uh, he says, I want to teach you wisdom as my father before taught me wisdom. And, but there's a lot of different themes that are repeated in the Proverbs. Uh, this idea of a strange woman, 
uh, the idea of hanging out with the wrong people, getting into trouble, the idea of, of gluttony or uh, uh, drunkardness, uh, the idea of lending money and, and uh, foolishly lending money. Uh, the, all these ideas are talked about, but we find that uh, some of these ideas are repeated several times. So there's really two things that he's emphasizing is there are certain things you should not do because it's foolish and then there's other things you should do because it's wise. So we're going to learn how not to be foolish and how to be wise. So with, with that thought in mind that, that some of these themes will be recurring over and over again the same idea will be coming back. I'm saying that because the last couple of chapters I've, I've discussed this strange woman concept uh, a couple of times already. But we didn't have these saints here with me to, to give me their viewpoint. So let me ask you, um, whoever wants to go first, uh, tell me what you think of the first few verses I just read. I think, of course, that the, um, we all know that uh, by keeping any commandments, uh, that will, you know, they won't get us saved. Only by believing on Christ can we be saved. But the, uh, with the Proverbs 7 here, where it says, uh, keep my commandments and leave, I think it's basically saying that uh, if you obey the laws of God, you know, you can have pretty good life on this earth. Um, like, for example, like, if you obey your parents, uh, that you will have longer life, um, and I, I think that's what the laws are for, in a way, to live our lives a little better and longer. Uh, otherwise, you know, as the scripture says, you know, the wages of sin is death. Um, if we don't keep our commandments, if we don't keep the commandments of God, then we may have shorter lives. So basically by keeping commandments uh, we can have fruitful lives uh, on this earth. All right, uh, Brother Eric or Brother Bill, what do you have to say about these, these verses? Well, what I find interesting in this verse is 4 and 5. And that both using a female example, you know, one one female obviously is wisdom. It's like a sister, a relation, a kinswoman, you know, someone you need to keep close. And the other one is a strange woman, and obviously the strange woman will flatter and take you off into the world and wilderness and all manner of, you know, devious behaviour. But but a good woman, you know, is likened to wisdom. You know, they keep you on the on the on the narrow path. And, and you know, as as you know, being married like most of us, you know, sometimes you do need a good woman to keep you on the, the straight and narrow. Sometimes, so I think that's probably why these verses are using a female. You know, because it is you know common knowledge. You know, a good woman is is a good thing and does help to keep you on the straight and narrow. But obviously, a bad woman, you know, you know, being a temptress will, will, will really drag you into the world. So I just find it interesting them two verses. You have a positive view, you know, of a wise, sister-like woman, and then obviously a negative, you know, that a woman can that can flatter and can, you know, beguile and take you off into the world. I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that uh, it's the idea of uh, wisdom versus foolishness. That's, that's really what the whole book of Proverbs is, is teaching us, that to be wise, not to be foolish. And with the sister, of course, uh, that's the, the wise woman that uh, we want to keep. She, she's representing wisdom. And then with the, uh, the, the strange woman, that would be representing foolishness. It would be very foolish to be seduced by the strange woman. Uh, Brother Eric, what's your take on these verses? No, I think those verses uh, speak for themselves. Uh, you could just uh, chew on them and meditate on them, and uh, it's just, uh, they are so pleasing to my soul. 
when when I do that. I love the Proverbs. Uh, I spent much time in there, and uh, I'm so glad to be covering them with you all again. Yeah, you talk about meditating on the Proverbs. Uh, I've said this in previous uh, um, studies on the previous chapters, but it's it's very uh, common for people to take the book of Proverbs as a meditative type of uh, book where when you meditate, that's being, that means you think about it over and over and over again. And uh, I think Brother Sam mentioned it in the first chapter that uh, he as a young man, he he would read a chapter of Proverbs each day. There's 31 chapters. And after a month, you start over and do it again, and, and you repeat that. And if we just go on repeating that over and over again, this wisdom just gets ingrained into our every cell of our body, it seems. Um, but the, the one thing that uh, Brother Sam was talking about as the law, you know, a lot of times he references the law, and uh, today we have a big problem within uh, Christendom they, that many people don't understand the purpose of the law. So I'd ask Brother Bill, could you, before we go on, and let, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what's, how the law is to be used. Uh, so read, read the part that talks about the law, and then please explain that to me. Yeah, yeah it says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the tail of thine heart. So, you know, the law to, to us, you know, in the New Testament as Christians, shows us that, that we are incapable of keeping the perfect and holy standard, you know, that, that God requires. And that's, you know, the law in essence was, I believe, to, to point us to Christ always. Because you know you look at the law, and straight away you know you can't do it. You kind of you you're left you're left wanting. You're falling short, and that and that the purpose of that is is so we can look at the law and say oh I've had it, but then we can turn away and look unto Christ and be saved, and that is the the, the New Testament example of, of the law. Obviously these these are perfect moral standards, and, and you know we we can look at them. And we can, we can, you know, we can try to, to, to keep these because it is for our own benefit. Obviously, you know, it's common sense. You know, don't murder. You murder someone. You know, if you live in America, you're going to get the death penalty and you're going to die. Or in this country, you probably get smacked around the head and be out in five years. But that's a different story. But you know, that there is a reason that they're there, and they're, they're moral and godly requirements that that it's good that we try to attain to. You know, we can't. So that's why we have Christ, you know, to, to, to do it for us. And Christ in us, you know, gives us the strength, I believe, and, and aids us in trying to live a godly life. So I'd like to elaborate um, a couple of uh, things that um, Brother Bill had mentioned earlier in verse 5. The, uh, uh, it says that the, uh, they may keep thee from the strange women and the stranger was flattered with her words. I would see that as the, uh, the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. Um, strange doctrines, uh, strange teachings, it's anything that's uh, of this earth, of this world, uh, I think that's what's referring. Uh, so, and also, in Exodus 20, uh, verse 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be longer upon the land which the Lord thy God gave, give, uh, give uh, thy God give thee. So this uh, particular verse uh, actually points out that when you honor your father and mother, you will have longer lives uh, on, on the land. And so I think for me, the law, keeping the law is like for our sake, our bodily sake, our physical sake. And also, as I said, you know, by keeping any law, uh, you know, that will not get us saved eternally, by, but by believing on Christ Jesus. So there, I consider the law or commandments as something, uh, something physical, uh, whereas uh, 
believing on Christ and having eternal life, uh, that ultimate wisdom, I think that's uh, spiritual in, in some sense. Okay, uh, I thought of something that uh, I'm not sure I'm correct. I would like to get your answer to this question. I, I know that uh, it's almost a reflex action where when people uh, see the, the word commandment or the word law, uh, they, they jump to a conclusion that is talking about the commandments given to Moses, to the Jewish people, to the Israelites. Uh, well, first of all, of course, the, 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 the laws to Israel through Moses were never given to us Gentiles. So that's, that's a big mistake for people to think that we are ever expected to follow those. The law that was given to the Gentiles, everybody apart from Israel, was the law of conscience that, that God gave us, according to Romans. But people seem to always automatically think that when we see the word commandment or law, it's talking about the, the laws given to Moses. But I'm wondering here in this verse here, and uh, I just posted it, by the way, in the Amplified Version. I'm going to read that, and I want to ask you, do you think it's possible that when, when Solomon, in this case, is talking about commandment, that he might be talking about his, the commandments he's writing here to his son in the book of Proverbs, not Mosaic law at all, but just saying, let me read it to why, to tell you, so you can see why it's struck me that way. It says, my son, keep my words, lay up within your, you my commandments. So it makes me think that uh, he's saying, keep my words. These are the words that he's written down here in the book of Proverbs that he's, that he's telling his son right now. He said, keep my words, lay up within, my, within you my commandments. Now he's not saying uh, the commandments or the commandments given to Moses or the, for the Israelites. He says, within you keep my commandments. Uh, for use when needed and treasure them, keep my commandments and live and keep my law and teaching as the apple, uh, the pupil of your eye. Uh, so uh, I won't read the rest of it in the Amplified right now, but I just want your take on that. Could you think it's possible that Solomon is not talking about the commandments given to Moses, but, but the, the words he's giving his son in this particular chapter? What do you think of that? Well, I think this... Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I think the better both is is my gut right. feeling. You know, it, it obviously, you know, it, it, the, the the wise words are coming from from Solomon to to his son, and we also know that, that Solomon was obviously given wise words from David and David. And, and it, it, so you can trace it back to the commandments, but also. You know, this is why I think it is a bit of both. So the commandments, we know the Ten Commandments, were for the Jews, were for the Israelites, of which obviously David, you know, Solomon and his son were. But also, you know, as we see through the, the, the book of Proverbs all the way through, you know, there's a lot of wise sayings, a lot of commandments and a lot of words that are actually common sense, you know, from his father. You know, so Solomon to his son. So that's why I think it's probably a bit of both. Yeah, I also agree that you know, as you said initially, you know, the commandments were for the children of Israel. You know, we, we, we have the, 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 the commandments of conscience, you know, written upon our hearts as saints. But, you know, as the children of Israel in that time, you know, they, they had the Ten Commandments. So, yeah, to answer that, I know running around a bit, but, yeah, I think it's probably a bit of both, personally. Yeah, I, I, I do agree as, as well. Um, you know, when, when the author says, my commandments... <coughs> Uh, or my law, um, that's the law or commandment that he's been following. Uh, it's not something he made up himself, and also when he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write such, that is, he's talking about the law of God, the commandments of God, including the, the laws and commandments given to Moses. I ask you to address the specific phrase in verse 1, keep my words. Does that uh, have any particular meaning uh, to support my, my uh, position there? Well, yeah, I, I believe it does. That's why I say I think this is probably a better both. You know, in, in this instance, you know, you mentioned the commands as 
because he says my commandments. I what 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 has a father his command and his son? But you know, the the the, the, the issue is, I suppose, is we don't know exactly what he's. I know we get a, a, a gist of what he's saying to his son through the proverbs, but in in regard to the commandments, is it just speaking of just his personal commands? Or was it speaking of the commands that he had from his father and his father's father? So yes, it's a little bit difficult. That's why I, I'm erring on the side of caution here. So you slap me on the wrist later. But you know, I, I'd say instinctively he's probably talking about both. But obviously, in that case, you know, he is more than likely talking about something that you know Solomon has commanded his son to do or to believe or, or to understand. But it's very, very deep. Right, also like, you know, when he says my son keep my, keep my words, we could also consider that uh, God is speaking through Solomon. And God is talking to Solomon. My son, keep my words. Uh, as if God is talking to him, communicating with him. And I don't think it's just... Uh, uh, the law of Solomon or the author, uh, I think it's uh, directly inspired from the Holy Ghost. And when he says, my words, my commandments, that's, I believe that's of God. That's yeah. just the Solomon's. Yeah, very good point. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, these words in the book of Proverbs, uh, the, all scripture is inspired by God. So, uh, Brother Eric, did you have any comment on this question I've, I've asked? Oh. Yes. Uh, I like to see it as the Ten Commandments under a microscope. Just as in the New Testament, all the epistles are love under a microscope. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's really uh, yeah taking a deep look into the meaning of, of the, the law and the commandments, and and really the, the the big fallacy about law and commandments, the world has taken them as a way of getting to heaven. If you follow commandments and keep the law that it well enough, then you'll satisfy God and He'll let you into heaven. But that's the fallacy we want to make sure that uh, everybody knows is is incorrect, and and uh, we don't believe that, and the scriptures tell us that that uh, none of us can um, keep laws and commandments perfectly, and, and that's why it was necessary for us to get get saved by God. And so Jesus Christ died for our sins and because we couldn't work our way to heaven. Um, so the law is good, and if we follow the law and if we get wisdom, then our lives are going to be better off. But that's not the means of getting to heaven. It's not part of a formula, uh, you know, a process of working our way to heaven. Uh, and let me ask you about this next part of that same section here where it says, uh, talks about um, that they may keep you from the loose woman, from the adventure who flatters with and makes smooth her words. That's the Amplified. It says from the loose woman. I think the KJV says a strange woman. Uh, they may keep you thee from the strange woman. Um, so it's amplified takes that strange woman as being a loose woman. Uh, there's an awful lot of talk about, you know, in, in Proverbs about adultery and the, the, the problem with that. But uh, what's your take on that verse 5? I think well, well, mine is, uh, uh, kept, Go ahead, Brother Bill. Okay, okay, if we keep getting in there at the same time. Now, I'll let you go first this time, Sam, because I got in first last time. You're, you're too nice. <laughs> I think Brother Bill has initially uh, touched upon that quite well, and I kind of elaborated uh, and compared the strange women being uh, strange doctrines, and you know how people like to uh, uh, heed to their own understanding uh, by, uh, you know, um, keeping themselves cl close to some um, strange doctrines. Uh, I think Again, uh, those kind of things, when, when the stranger, which flattered with her words, meaning, you know, you only like to listen to the things that your itching ears want to hear. And that sort of vain things, 
uh, will not go anywhere because it's not of God. And I think basically that's what the, you know, analytically the uh, verse five is uh, is being is comparing. Well, the root that we get. Yeah, I was just gonna just say it because you you just hit I think hit hit the proverbial nail on the head there. And I'll just post it in there, and that's obviously two Timothy four three. You know, it says, for a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. And, and these teachers, and it doesn't even have to be biblical, because, you know, you know, Christendom has got enough problems as it is with, you know, with, with err uh, and heresies and the like, that, that people go off and, and, and want their ears tickled. But this is talking about the world as well. You know, the world is offering, you know, science, pseudoscience, you know, we've been debating that, me and Sam, quite a lot of the last few days, we've really been, you know, coming against it, but, you know, the world offers, you know, youngsters, you know, the, 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 a, a fake science and stuff, and, and their ears have been tickled, you know, they think, well, if we follow this fake science, then we must be clever, and if we're clever, we're going to be liked, and, and et cetera, and et cetera, so they've been flattered by fake science and worldliness and all that the enemy offers. Whereas, the, you know, the sister, the wise sister in this situation is just coming straight from the word of God. And, and I think, you know, that this can be taken not only within, you know, a, 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 a Christian sense or a religious sense, but also in the sense of, of, of the world. You know, the son, you know, having to make the decision between a, a, a wise sister you know, which leads to a good life and ultimately salvation, or a flattering woman that that would lead to, to perversion, lies, and could you know lead to you know destruction. So yes, yeah, it's very it's very. That's how I see it personally. Okay, I uh, I'm going to uh, we'll look, focus on one word here for a second, just because it, it is a personal. Thing for me that uh, kind of I'm very apprehensive about the word flatter. Uh, uh, if, if you know me quite well. Uh, I'm sure that all the time that we've talked, and that uh, you've noticed that uh, I want to compliment you if if I if I feel that it's uh, you know justified. I think, like Sam, I, I told you how much I liked your last two videos so much. And, and if, when the opportunity comes up, I'd, I'd like to be able to compliment someone and encourage him and tell him, I, I appreciate what you're doing, and you're doing well, and, and so on. But then in the back of my mind, I have this thing that's kind of like messing with me. It's saying, I, I hope I'm not ever taken as a flatterer, someone who's just saying nice things and flattering in order to try to manipulate in some way. So I don't know if I'm overreacting. It's a little, uh, you know, a paranoia going on in my brain there. On one hand, I want to be able to give everybody compliments when I think that um, it's deserved. And on the other hand, I'm a little bit, a little bit leery, thinking that I don't, don't want to everybody think I'm using flattery. Uh, I don't think no, that's just. I'll just put it in. Worry about that. Because you know when when it comes to like the words of God and 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 being edified, you know I mean we should flatter each other, quote unquote. But when it comes to worldly stuff, uh, then you know if you kind of o overly do that, it can kind of look weird. <laughs> you know what what does, what does he want from me, kind of thing. You know, but as as far as edification is concerned, as far as actual uh, when we discuss the scripture and and um, and and actually, we give our thoughts. Uh, flattering it is also giving our thoughts in regards to um, edifying, uh, and also especially when we talk about uh, certain uh, scriptures and, and things. Uh, I just want to share Second Timothy four three here. It says, "For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust." Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears? And I think it goes well with uh, this particular verse, uh, uh, Proverbs 7 5, where it says, flattering her with her words. And 
that's I think what's going on even nowadays, especially nowadays. All right, brother Eric or brother uh, Bill. Yeah, I was only not. So I'm just going to back up what what Sam was saying. I think what what, what we do what, edification is good. You know, you can lavish edification upon each other as saints for, for the sake of encouragement, for the sake of fellowship and love. But the the, the word, like I said, flatter, it, it, it's it's insincere. So it would be like, you know, edification, but insincerely. You know, you're, you're overindulging someone, you know, insincerely. You're not believing what they're saying and, and you don't care what they say. So I think that's that's the big difference between them two, the, the two verses, the two women. You know, one is sincere, looking out for the best interests. The other one, you know, with the flattering words, is totally insincere and hasn't got their best interests at heart at all. Yeah, well, I I have a sincere fear that uh, that some people might think I'm insincere. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know the, the the difference is sincerity, um, but you don't know how someone else is going to interpret interpret you, and that that's that's the worry I've always had, and it's probably just a I don't know if anyone else maybe even thinks this way, but it's it's always been a, a, in the back of my mind, or playing with me. Um, all right, now uh, I, I think we can go on here. Oh, I'm going to ask you about this. It says in verse three, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Uh, now you know that the, Jew, the uh, Jewish people who uh, we know as Pharisees became very legalistic, uh, 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 religious, hyper-religious, and, and they would take some of these things uh, and make it into a literal commandment. So they would do is they would write a verse, put it in a little box, and then wrap it, the box upon their their hand or their arm or, or their arm or their should be by their heart or they'd even wear them on their head saying they, this is keeping it in your in your head in your mind um, so what do you think of, of these people who go to such a literal extreme type of legalism with these verses when it seems to me this is obviously a symbolic thing uh, in verse 3 Right, right. It's, uh, it says the the table of thine heart. You know, it doesn't. It, you know, it doesn't. If this just stops at the upon the table, that you know, what they're doing could you know may, may be legit. But it says of thine heart. So it's like your heart versus your ears. Uh, it's, it's 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 like a true words versus flattering words, uh, fake words. So uh, bind them, thy fingers of thine heart, write them upon the table of thine heart. So it's, it's, about, it's about heart to heart rather than actually, you know, what is, appears to be putting on your forehead or <laughs> wrapping around as a clothes. So I think that's the key word right here, thine heart. And, of course, uh, when, uh, when we have the love of Christ, you know, this sort of things will uh, will come about automatically. It does, you know, no matter how much you don't like to, you know, when you have the love of Christ, this will just automatically be done by the Holy Spirit. So it's such a comfort. Now the word heart uh, there uh, is that it, I believe it's it's intended as you said your heart. Is not to be taken as an organ that pumps blood. It's to be taken as that it's deep inside your your inner being, your inner mind, your mind, your your have it, a heartfelt conviction, not as the Pharisees would do. They put the verse in a box, tape it to their bicep, and it'll be right next to that organ of their heart that pumps blood. So it's not a hollow. It's not a hollow muscular organ that pumps the blood. Through the uh, uh, circulatory system, uh, but rather it's the it's the central 
or innermost part of something, you know, innermost of ourselves. That that's that's what it means by thy heart. So, what do you think of the kind of extreme uh, way that they they dealt with these things, where they were be making it into a legalistic, literal type of a, 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 a commandment? Well, this is it. That that that, that missed the point completely, didn't they? You know, that 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 taken <laughs> what Christ and God is saying for our scriptures, you know, spiritually. And they're taking it literally, you know. And, th and this is why it even says in Ezekiel, it says in other places that there come a time where it, it will write you know, the spiritual laws on their hearts. And they will have a heart of flesh and not a stone. You know, the, uh, the stone tablets, the commandments were stone because that represented the stony, cold hearts, you know, of the, of the children of Israel. But there, and he prophesies a time will come when people will have a, a heart of flesh, not talking about the organ that pumps, but it's talking about your soul. You know, that, that it will become like flesh, it becomes subtle, become kind, it become loving. And, and on upon that heart God can write, you know, his spiritual laws. And that's the and the, like I said, that they took it wrong. They took it literal and, and they're still hard hearted. Where it should have been, you know, taken as spiritual and and their heart should have been softened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, if it is written in, in in our hearts, then there's no point of carrying carrying some leather box around. <laughs> there's no point of wrapping wrapping yourself or making clothes out of it. If it is written in your heart, then you know it's already you're already carrying. You're you're already it's uh, the the law is already there. So you know, I mean, you don't have to keep reminding yourself. That's one of the reasons. Why, when you have that love of Christ in you, you don't have to write all over you. <laughs> it's in you already. Yeah, let me ask Brother Eric. Uh, you know, Jesus talked about how these Pharisees were following the commandments and traditions of men rather than the, the, the word of God, the, the, the letter of the law. This is an example of the letter of the law rather than the heart of the law. What the true meaning of the verse is not your literal heart as an organ and, and keep your verses written down next to your heart. That that's the letter of the law. That's what it says, but the but the real true meaning of it is something else. Brother Eric, you get last word on this and we'll we'll move on. Yes. Uh I really don't blame them because they were dead inside and uh, it was a natural response. Uh, to the law, there was a handful of uh, men in the Old Testament that did have a precognition of uh, grace, like uh, uh, Abraham and David, and who knew the law inside their hearts. But for the most part, it was just uh, until Christ uh, uh, finished his work on the cross, it was impossible for them to... Uh, write them up on the table of their hearts in sincerity. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, I'd like to move on unless anybody else thinks that something else needs to be said on this. Okay, let's go to, uh, now we're going to go starting with verse 6. Um, For at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and, and among the simple, Empty-headed. Oh, I'm looking. I'm reading the Amplified. Let me read KJV first. Uh, For at the window of my house, I looked through my ease, my casement, and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. We'll start there. Verse, we'll go to verse 6 through 10. Uh, discuss that first. Uh, brother, uh, whoever wants to go first on that, please go ahead. Well, just a casement is a window that can open. Some windows can't open, and a casement is a window that can open. 
So I'll just quickly let that one in before we carry on. Okay. Yeah, obviously this is, um, you know, this is what he actually saw, and also he can this can uh, apply analogically, um, of course. Um, I kind of immediately thought of uh, evolution and how um, how how the youth get educated by that sort of uh, pseudoscience um, who are quite innocent of their uh, their own situation and understanding so obviously for the people who are not so uh, wise so to say they are as the scriptures say a, a young man void of understanding void of understanding meaning you know you cannot understand you just don't understand you're just that thick so that's what's going on, I think, and I think we also see that through certain public educations, uh, you know, especially nowadays. So this uh, term, uh, and be held among the simple ones, uh, I discerned among the youth a young man void of understanding. Uh, when it's, he says simple ones, uh, are we to take that as the word simpleton, someone who is low in intelligence, or does the simple, simple ones, uh, does that go along? Why is it this one person, that a young, one young man, stands out to him, who's void of understanding? But doesn't wouldn't, doesn't it doesn't seem that if there's a group of simple ones, that they would all be lacking some understanding? Yes, well, certainly I would think it is speaking in regard to simple in, in, in the terms of, of godly wisdom. You know, that's, you don't have to be a simpleton. You know, some of the most intellectual people on earth are, are completely simple in regard to to, to, to to spiritual matters. And you know, as 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 you was even reading that straight away. Came, came, came in me, me, me heart and into me mind. Hosea 4 6. Is it right if I quickly read that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest to me, saying, Thou hast forgotten the law of our God, I will also forget thy children. So it, is, it seems these people are, are willfully, you know, deliberately. Not seeking godly knowledge, so I ain't as if you know that they're, they're simpletons as in intellect and not being able to grasp knowledge. These people are willfully ignoring, you know, that godly wisdom and knowledge. And, and, and I suppose you know, it was someone was probably at the graph seeing this picture in his mind as someone that is probably could be intellectual, probably intelligent, but they've, they've chose to be simple and chosen not to, to to follow wisdom and to follow the the flattering woman instead. Now, let me, uh, let me describe what uh, Brother Bill just did, and, and what Sam and Eric and I have all, all done today. Um, you have uh, commented on this verse, and p people who are theologians have commented and written it down, and these things are called commentaries. Um, you've expounded, uh, or as this other translation I'm going to read, you've amplified. You've, you've expounded and amplified what the meaning is of the verse. And you've done it in your own way, according to your own insights, according to the Holy Spirit teaching you, and according to your vocabulary, the way you communicate. And we all benefit from these kinds of things, from commentary. So, so uh, there are some people I've met who uh, don't think you should look at a different translation than the KJV. Now, but when you look at other translations, I look at them as like a commentary. If someone did another translation in modern English, it's kind of like Brother Sam or something commenting on this verse, and he's explaining it in his words. And there is some value in listening to Brother Sam, and there's some value in, in looking at another commentary, I mean another translation or a commentary. Or as what I like about this amplified version is it's translating and commenting at the same time. Uh, 
But I'll, I'll just look at this verse 7 in the Amplified here quickly, and you'll see an example of what I'm saying here. It says, he says, and among the simple, and then in parentheses it says, empty-headed and empty-hearted ones. So it says, among the simple, empty-hearted and empty ones, I perceived among the youths a young man void of good sense. So um, that's the amplified version. And that's what Brother Bill just did. He amplified as he de described his interpretation of these verses. Uh, all right, let me get your take on that. Uh, this It says, among the simple, and he says, empty-headed and empty-hearted ones. That's how the amplified version explains this idea of being these simple ones. They're empty-headed and empty-hearted. I think that well, uh, the couple of important things that Brother Bill mentioned was that the uh, when he said about uh, willful, uh, willfully ignoring things, or uh, deliberately ignoring things, and I think that's the key. And a lot of times, uh, a lot of people they like to uh, heed to their own understanding, uh, and also they like to just uh, so to say swallow what others spew. And the thing is, when when they do that, they'll only appeal to what they only know. Um, that, in in a way, philosophical term is, when they do that, they're making the informal fallacy of ignorance, appealing to ignorance. So when they appeal to their own ignorance, I think they become um, the simple ones, as, as the, the verse 7 is talking about. So the youth, uh, the young man, is basically, the reason why he's so void of understanding is because he's so much into his own understanding. He does only things that he likes to do. And that's why he is the simple one. And... <clears throat> And, uh, yeah, willful ignorance. I think that's the key. Okay, I, I just posted the amplified verse in here in the comment, in verses 6 through 10. And when he says here, uh, among the simple, empty-headed, and empty-hearted ones, I perceived among the youth a young man void of good sense. And in the KJV it says, void of understanding. So do you think it's acceptable? In this case, to say that uh, he's void of understanding, that means he's void of good sense. Some people would say, use the term common sense today. Common sense or critical thinking, but I, I think it goes a little more than that. Um, the simple ones here uh, it, it are not necessarily uh, so-called uh, uh, empty-headed ones. Uh, there are many knowledgeable people. Uh, there are many people who actually, you know, hold degrees and have a lot of uh, uh, knowledge, so to say. But since they are not of God, they tend to heed to their own understanding. And they are so prideful of their own. And sometimes, even if they are smart, not empty headed, but smart and full of knowledge, since they are not of God, they don't. Uh, they cannot really discern what's true. Just like the youth, the young man who is who is void of understanding, and I think that's a distinction here. The distinction here is that you can be quite full-headed, you can be full of knowledge, yet you could be one of the most simple ones. Uh, who, 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 who is void of understanding, because his understanding is based on man-made stuff, this stranger woman that that flattered with his words, uh, and since he's not, uh, his understanding is not based on the word of God and the wisdom of God, and obviously, he he wouldn't have any discernment. All right, let me read the uh, these uh, verses in the. Uh, in context uh, with in the Amplified, and then ask Brother Eric. Uh, Brother Eric, listen to this. Just give me your reaction to this 
in the Amplified Version, verses 6 through 10. For at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and among the simple, empty-headed, and empty-hearted ones, I perceived among the youth a young man void of good sense. Sauntering through the street, the loose woman's corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, night black and dense was falling over the young man's life. And behold, there met him a woman, dressed as a harlot, and sly and cunning of heart. Uh, absolutely, and that could even be reconciled to the actual uh, real world. Uh, there's something about uh, going off a whoring that is very uh, lethal to your soul. And most people that are inclined to do that never take hold of the paths of life. In the uh, last chapter or two, you know, I, I talked about my own personal uh, dealings with this kinds of feelings, you know, uh, and I certainly have to admit that, you know, and now that I'm 64, I'm not not tempted as I was when I was young by the beauty of a woman this, and the seductiveness of, of, of a beautiful woman, but. Uh, as a young man, I wasn't immune to that, and it was uh, uh, some the period of time, of course, before I was a Christian. You know, my whole attitude about that kind of thing was was totally different now than it is today. But uh, I, I think of the young men who have to deal with these kinds of temptations and the struggle, the the difficulty of of coping with this powerful sex drive and the seductiveness of a, a beautiful, sexy woman. And uh, so those people who do not uh, uh, hold to these Christian values that we hold to, uh, as I did, did, did not at one time, I didn't think twice about you know, uh, be, behaving badly in, the, in these situations. Uh, and, and then after I got saved, my I was changed. Uh, my attitude about these things changed, and, and then it was difficult because I still had a a the attraction, but I also had the Holy Spirit holding me back. And but there was a conflict going on. Oh, oh wretched man that I am, as Paul said, you know. So uh, well, let me ask you guys to kind of personalize this, if you can, a little bit, the way I just did about the power of the seductive woman. And the, the the difficulty of particularly being a young man dealing with that. Well, absolutely. I just yeah, absolutely. And, and to be honest, I'm not quite not quite as old and as wise as you, yet, Luke. But it's still it's still as a, a powerful and strong force, you know, even to people my age. So it's, you know, it's very hard to. You know, avoid in that sense the, the draw that is. You know, the temptation is, is is ever present. That is, if you're a full-blooded male. You know, I know some men that are never tempted by, you know, seductive women. But I think they've obviously got testosterone problems. But it's is a struggle, I believe, for every man. And I know, although I believe, you know, obviously the proverbs is, is speaking within a, a spiritual context, seductive to the world seductions. But yeah, you can also use it in a practical and physical context that, that, that women are beautiful and are very good at seducing. Anybody else? Well, you know, you notice that in verse uh, 9, uh, it says, uh, in the twilight. And twilight is like uh, when the sky is when the sun is below the horizon, uh, and uh, in the evening, in the in the black and dark night. So, I mean, where's the sun? <laughs> so obviously, this guy has that much of understanding that what he's doing is not so so called, uh, you know, something that you could, you know, do in the broad daylight. So he he knows that much, but 
you know, but still he is going there to meet this woman uh, with the attire of an harlot. And uh, it kind of reminds me of this, uh, of Catholic as well, you know, how how they do things uh, kind of in the dark, un under under table, uh, how uh, how they sell uh, Jesus Christ, so to say, uh, for profit, uh, like a harlot. Um, so basically, I think that um, these guys, this guy, actually knows uh, when to visit this women. And that's when, uh, when there's no sun, or just a little bit of sun, or just going down, just or something. And obviously, uh, you know, a woman, not every woman, uh, dress with the attire of an harlot, a prostitute, right? So obviously, this this women we're talking about a very specific one, you know, since not women are like are like are not are not women, not all women are like that. So, <clears throat> what kind of person would be uh, heeding to strange doctrines, uh, strange words? Uh, I, I, I would say he's quite into uh, heretical <laughs> doctrine, and uh, and and how he's just kind of moves in the dark uh, for this sort of uh, harlot, so to say. Uh, brother, let me, does everybody have a chance to talk about that before I ask another question? I, I don't remember Eric commenting. Eric? Uh, yes, it's a very uh, serious matter, and uh, it's uh, many people haven't really gotten a handle on it, and it's very important for... Uh, Christians also as well to get a handle on this because God did put that sex drive in us so man wouldn't uh, go extinct and uh, that's God gave us marriage uh, to deal with that and uh, yes it's, it's a very serious situation well let me ask everybody how to just give me your uh, for the for the audience, why should not someone go ahead and and uh, enjoy these these feelings um, outside of a marriage, whether it's premarital among unmarried people, or whether it's extramarital, and why be limited to just your wife when there's other women? Uh, when a person does engage in that. Why not? I mean, uh, obviously Solomon's saying don't do it, and we know that throughout the scriptures it says don't fornicate, don't commit adultery. But but a, apart from just the, the commands and instructions to not do these things, why not? What's the what's the possible reason reason that uh, people should not just go ahead and, and uh, go ahead and give in to these powerful sexual uh, urges. Now, I don't know. Yeah, you know, the sexual urges. I think that's kind of minor part. You know, of course, that's that's something. You know, you can get over, uh, or if you don't have any money, you can't even do that. Uh, but what I'm more concerned about is that, just like, uh, you know, how, just like how, just like how you get into cult or some sort of heretical doctrine or heresy. You know, there is only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And, you know, other, like such as Catholic, uh, <laughs> basically, uh, it's like the harlot here. Uh, and other religions would be saying, other prostitutes, so to say, would be saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm going to make you happy. I'm going to uh, give you pleasure. I'm. 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 I'm also the way to God. You know, come and believe me. Uh, you know, with all kinds of seducing words. Uh, but 
as we all know, there is only one way to God. And, and if anyone were to say otherwise, uh, I, I would consider them as like this halot here. So you've mentioned the Roman Catholic, you know, that a Roman Catholic could rationalize and, and say, I can go fornicate and have extramarital affair and then just go confess to the priest. So then, then that's going to be resolved that way. And then, you know, we are not Roman Catholic. We understand that the, the, the errors of it. Uh, and we, we, we are biblical Christians and we understand that all of our sins, past, present, and future, were already paid for on the cross. So uh, if we fornicate or commit adultery, it's not going to affect our salvation. It's already secured. And therefore, what reason would a person not want to uh, give in to these demands? I'm going to ask Brother Bill if he has something to say about that. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah on a physical sense. It causes problems. It's always problematic. It's not beneficial whatsoever. You know, if you're sleeping around, you get physical problems. You can get a, a sexually transmitted disease on a physical level, on an emotional level. That the, the harm that, that it causes families and peoples. You know, when you do, you know, if someone did commit adultery. You know, break up of families. That there's some real emotional, traumatic things to deal with. So, you know, on a practical level, you know, God has given us some real, what we called a few weeks ago, uncommon sense, it used to be common sense, you know, ideals. You know, he doesn't want us to be harmed emotionally. He doesn't want us to be harmed, you know, physically. Yeah, I know we're, we're saved as Christians, it's a done deal spiritually, but it still hurts us a lot, and it hurts all around us. So these are good common sense practical ways to, 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 to keep yourself spiritually strong, emotionally strong, and even, you know, physically healthy. So God's good intentions are throughout on, on all levels there. All right. Um, so Bill says there's physical consequences, there's emotional consequences. Obviously, physical consequences could be uh, sexually transmitted disease, sickness, and maybe even death. Um, it could be a uh, physical consequence, a, a, a child comes into the world, a, a, a baby is born uh, outside of a marriage, and, and that, that makes, uh, creates all kinds of problems for everybody involved. It could also cause the problem of, of a divorce. You may have a very unforgiving spouse, and uh, in a way, who can, who can blame your spouse for being very upset and not trusting you? And, you know, maybe we can say, well, she should forgive, but uh, it does cause divorces, broken families. And uh, so there's all kinds of consequences, and, and it's, it's not worth the, the moments, the few moments of, of pleasure, it's not worth it. And if you really want to be wise, uh, well, uh, let's, let's move on. Unless, Brother Eric, you want to say something about this before we move on? Uh, yes, I would like to say that uh, before the cross, uh, it's a way of before before getting saved. It's it's a way of transferring demons. After you're saved, if you simply do it in your mind, you'll grieve the Holy Spirit, and that was meant only for your wife. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go on to verse 11 now. Uh, let's look at it first in the KJV, uh, verse 11. Uh, she is loud and stubborn. Is this the KJV? Yeah. Uh, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. She is, now, now is she without now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day I have prayed my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. 
I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. Wow. All right, whoever wants to go first on that. Well, we actually certainly is Harlan because her husband's gone away to earn the, earn the bread and she's out having her delights and, and, and fun and, and not thinking about the consequences. So, yeah. Again, it's, um, for me, um, I like to go beyond that. I just, this is um, about this Hollywood, uh Catholic, Roman Catholic, of course. Um, you know, verse from verse 14, uh, you know, it says, I have peace offerings, and with me this day have I paid my, paid my vows. I mean, it's like, I'm ordained, you can trust me, I'm peaceful, I'm loving, come to me, <laughs> you know, I can take care of things, I decorate all these things, you know, and we can have this totally dark mass, <laughs> and, um, you know, you can enjoy ourselves until the morning, um, it's like in verse 19, for the good man, it says, good man is not at home. I, I consider that as Christ. Uh, Christ is not uh, at, 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 at church. He's gone for a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come back, come home at the day, at the day appointed. So this Hallet obviously knows uh, also what not to do, <laughs> but still, She's doing it, and she's she's bound to this good man. Yet she's just whoring around. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can also apply that sort of uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, how should I say, kind of symbolically or in a way, oh, analogically. Yeah, I was just wanted to just you know, like on a spiritual level, I think you're probably bang on there. Cause what what does it for me is verse twenty, where it says you've taken you know a bag of money with him, i.e. treasures, and will come back you know come home that point of day, you know and that and that's to me on a spiritual sense that could very well be speaking prophetically even uh, of Christ coming back to the point of day, you know so this this could be you know on, on a personal spiritual note, you know even talking about the Roman Church in that sense, you know that 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 you know, tempting people with all manner of things and and just getting on and doing whatever they do, you know, waiting for that point of day, you know, because under that, you know, that pseudo religion, you know, it don't kind of matter what you do, as long as you, you pay the money to the church, as long as you, as you, as you say, I paid my vows, you do your penance and, and, and that lot, you know, all is good and well. So I think it probably has got a very deep spiritual context to this, these verses as well. Yeah, that's why it's the Word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Eric, before I have a question for everyone, I would see if we want to respond to this overall. Yeah, uh, that's just not love. Love doesn't do that. Yeah, yeah, it's very succinct and, and, and true. Um, uh, I will say though that um, this woman in this case here is really a seductress. She's really selling it. She's really trying to persuade him, really tempting him in every way. And now, um, if a man listens to her and and ends up going with this woman and some men, some people could tell their wife if they're discovered he couldn't help it, it just, it just happened. I've heard this many times from people that they say they fell in love with someone and they're leaving their wife or they, or they had some just affair like this just even, a, even if it's only once, it just happened. 
I want to know if you, you can tell me why it's not uh, possible for a, 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 anyone to tell their spouse it just happened. No, it just it just don't just happen. <laughs> it needs a lot of premeditated stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, for example, in verse 19, she said, for the good man is not at home. And she knows that if the good man is home, then she, she wouldn't do that. But since he's not home, that she thinks that she, she can do that, you know. Uh, yeah, the woman is very plotting and scheming here and seducing, but the man, what is his excuse if he if he agrees? Can he just say to his wife, oh, I'm really sorry, it just happened. Uh, anybody want to answer that? Because I've got a, uh, an answer waiting. He's the one who went there. <laughs> He's the one walking around her house. He's the one going into her house at, at, at night, at dark. I mean, he doesn't have any excuse. Neither one of them have any excuse. Yeah, on, 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 a, on a physical, practical level, it needs a, a slap around the back of the head for, for, being, for being so weak-minded in that sense. And on a spiritual level, you know, he's going to have a chest in Okay, uh, brother uh, Eric mentioned well, this is this is not love, uh, but I, it may be possible. It may be possible for someone to deeply love their spouse, and yet they still get persuaded and and and, and uh, act out this this horrible thing uh, with terrible consequences. But what I'm asking is. Is it possible for for this to just to happen? Just oh, it just happened. I, I I don't know if if you've ever heard that, but I've heard it many times, particularly on some of these shows on TV when your people are talking about this in public and are on a talk show and they say it just happened. I couldn't help it. Just well, I say no. It does. It doesn't just happen. I mean, I've I said this in an earlier uh, chapter, but. A, a person does not just step on a banana peel, fall down, hit the ground, and then discover that their penis is inside a woman. It doesn't just doesn't happen like that. You don't just fall down and now all of a sudden you're in adultery, you're in fornication. It doesn't just happen. There are many steps along the way, many opportunities to stop, many doors that we must go through before this finally does happen. And a person has plenty of opportunities to have second thoughts and stop and not go through the next door. I mean, you it could begin with a, with a, with a smile, and then a, a little flirtation, and then a conversation, and then a little inappropriate conversation, and, 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 and then a plan. And then uh, going to the house and knocking on the door and then going through the door. All these things are steps, doors that you have to go through. So um, uh, a person has no excuse. To, you, you cannot just say that it just happened. Uh, this seduction and this, even if a man is seduced by a woman or vice versa, or even if a man is not seduced, but he, he has the plan, he's going to go out and, and do it. There, there's plenty of opportunities to not go through that next door. That's why I, I believe that uh, it, it is inexcusable. I'll go on to the next verses unless anybody wants to say further, talk further about that. No, I just wanted to say I don't I agree. We get that all. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to look now at verse. Uh, look at these remaining verses here, uh, verses 21 in the KJV. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, 
as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. We'll stop right there. Um, I wanted to read the last part in, the, in the, the Amplified, and I forgot to do that, but maybe I'll go back and read the Amplified all the way through when we're all done, and just to get it and make it as real plain as can be. But verses 21 through 23, whoever wants to talk about that, go ahead. I'll post that. Again, I, I would, uh, you know, compare that with uh, fair speeches of men, whether they're so Catholic or whether they're politically. You know, nowadays, you know, you can't even be a president with with your mouth. <laughs> you know, if you speak well, you know, you can be somebody, I guess. But uh, obviously, this sort of fair speech, uh, you know, flattering fair speech, so to say, uh, will convince you convince others um, to vote for you or to become a, a, a part of a court, a biggest court like Catholic, uh, and and that will only lead into hell, basically. Uh, I mean, what I mean, what if you are if you're going to that sort of slaughter a, sl a slaughterhouse, like a dumb sheep or something or dumb, dumb ox. Uh, uh, you know, you you will get punctured in your liver. Uh, so it's very important to keep ourselves very close to the Word of God, and and actually not to uh, be so uh, how should I say swallowing that sort of strange and false doctrines and heresies. All right, verse 21 through 23, anybody else want to comment on that? Just what we found interesting in verse 21, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield, and with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. So it's as if, she had some kind of power over this this person, whether spiritually speaking or physically, that forced him. This is just interesting. You know, it almost contradicts what we said about ten minutes ago without obviously reading that. And, and so this must be talking on, on a spiritual level, as opposed to physical, because you know we, we already, you know, decide and, and agree that you know on a physical level. You know, we have got some type of self-control. We can, you know, we don't, as you said, I don't want to repeat it, but we don't slip over a banana and then I'll do we watch this go inside. So on a physical level, we can have self-control and, and we, can, we can avoid this. But it's just that word, you know, she forced him. So that must be deep in the physical, you know, scenario. Well, I think we could... Uh you know, take a, a spiritual, broader look at all of it as Sam's doing, but I, I think this is a, a applying to actual uh, adultery and whoring. And it, it, it um, the interesting thing to me about she forced him is that uh, it shows you the power of this sex drive in men. And, you know, I. I've never been a woman, so I can't answer to you know how how powerful it is for them or or um, you know. But I, I know as a man, the control that it had over me when I was young, and and if I'm, the best thing the man can do is nip it in the bud at the very very beginning, because once he goes through one door and then the next door, the seduction, the power is so overwhelming that now. Maybe there's no escape because he's gone so far, and uh, it feels like you know he has no choice because he's so overwhelmed by this the power of this sex drive. Um, that's how I, I see this. The flattering of her lips is so powerful, and the seduction. Look what she said in the last time. I mean, I mean, what a what a pitch she made. It's uh, 
I mean, that, and if she, I'm assuming she has beauty in addition to the persuasion of her words. Uh, that uh, he went, once he started listening, and he went, he fell into the trap. Uh, Brother Eric. Uh, yes, it, it is a trap, and uh, where it says uh, she forced him, that was uh, when he passed the point of no return. But he did go there with intent. Yeah, yeah. So he did go there with a tent. That's that's the beginning of his problem. He was foolish to even think of doing such a thing. And then, so he was a willing participant from the beginning, uh, in this case. Uh, but then we look at twenty verse twenty two. It it tells us that he got caught. You know, he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, uh, or, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. So. He's basically at a certain point so in control by the seduction and this uh, sex drive that it's like he's put in the stocks. And, but that is, the, I think that the, uh, the, the reason why she can cause him to yield and the, the reason why she can give that much of flattering words to the point that she could force him, uh, I think is because she had this sort of experience more than once with other men. So, you know, again, I'm comparing to Catholic, uh, that the, what many of those guys have been doing throughout the history, ever since the birth of this Roman Catholic, and uh, throughout the medieval time, and their um, heretical doctrines, and how they have been persecuting real Christians, so to say, and um, how they have been exclusively uh, yeah, doing this sort of things, uh, uh, taking many to the slaughter. Uh, so again, you know, she is quite experienced. She knows what she's doing, and it's not really her first time doing this. And of course, the young man, void of understanding, obviously will. will for, for her snare. Yeah, uh, so uh, Brother Bill, is, it talks about, as far as being forced, that he's gone so far that now it's almost like he's in the stocks. And then the consequence, of course, begins to come out in verse 23. Brother Bill? Are you there, Brother Bill? All right. Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. I think Brother Bill is kind of uh, out of his desk at the moment, probably. All right. Uh, I just didn't know if I lost the connection. As long as you can hear me. Um, if Bill's not back, I'll just read verse 23 again, and, and we can talk more about that. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth, hasteth to the sneer, and knoweth not that it is for his life. All right. Brother Eric? Uh -huh. Now we're getting into the consequences of his actions. Yeah. It's pretty graphic. As a bird hasteth to the snare, when it says, no, a dart strike through his liver. It's very, very graphic as far as the seriousness of what's happening here. The consequence, a dart in your liver, and a bird's caught in the snare, but he doesn't realize that it's going to cost him his life. I mean, this verse clearly... Um suggests that this is not merely uh, just observation or just merely uh, some something happened physically, but it's, it's quite uh, analog analogically uh, comparing uh, the spiritual life. I mean, the uh, when you go when you are into that sort of heretical doctrine, such as Roman Catholic. Um, you're just going to die. You're just going to, you're going to die slowly, painful, slow death. 
you know. That's what verse 23 is basically saying. I mean, we know that just because you um, go to some prostitute, uh, you, it's not going, you're not going to lose your life, what sort of, sort of say, physical life. But verse 23 is that it is for his life. So we are, uh, we, we are considering this, I am considering this verse as quite an analogical uh, and how dangerous uh, it is to be into that sort of heretical teachings and, and, and cult such as Catholic. I'll tell you what I find interesting, and I don't mean to go off onto a tangent here, but you know, this was written thousands of years ago before modern science, and it's interesting that, that it says, you know, that, that, that a dart that strikes, you know, through his liver. And, and modern science will tell you, and biology, and, and doctors, and, and stuff, that, that, that one of the most painful illnesses or diseases you get is when your liver packs in. It's slow, and it's painful, and it just seems poignant with what you just said, you know, that a, a slow death, you know, and, and it's just interesting that it mentions the liver, which generally is, is a slow and painful death. It's not quick. I want to read this uh, three verses in the Amplified and then get your reaction. It, it says, With much justifying and enticing argument, she persuades him. With the allurements of her lips, she leads him to overcome his conscience and his fears and forces him along. Suddenly, he yields and follows her reluctantly like an ox moving to the slaughter, like one in fetters going to the correction to be given to a fool or like a dog enticed by food to the muzzle till a dart of passion pierces and inflames his vitals then like a bird fluttering straight to, into the net he hastens not knowing that it will cost him his life Well, basically the same as KJV is basically um, he's being persuaded, uh, he's been led with a uh, full understanding. Obviously, he can't. He's void of understanding, and then uh, the consequences: slow death, painful slow death. Uh, so it's um, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's. Even the harlot itself is quite compatible, and I, I see this as quite a prophecy in a way, you know, as well. Yeah, it's I think that last verse is the prophetic part that uh, the consequences are going to be so severe. It's going to cost him his life. Now, maybe it'll cost him, it'll cost him his life at, at, unto actual death, or maybe it'll cost him his life as he knew it with his wife and his children and in the community and the shame in the community when everybody finds out and, and, and then there's a divorce and, and then all the people that knew him and respected him now they know what he did and now that his life as he knew it is over so this is really talking about uh, you know how serious the consequences are as we, we mentioned earlier um, I'm going to read the final verses unless someone wants to talk further about those three. Okay. Now, only, only, only that I, that I think the King James has got it right when it says liver on that anyway. So I checked the Hebrew and it is liver, which is the largest organ, obviously apart from the skin, but internal organ. Okay. All right. So now the last three ver uh, verses, and I think, are. Uh, 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 starting with verse 24 hearken unto me now therefore O ye children and attend the words of my mouth let not thine heart decline to her ways go not astray in her paths for she hath cast down many wounded yea many strong men have been slain by her her house is the way to hell going straight to the chambers of death.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't hit your understanding. Don't, don't, don't be in bed with heresies. Uh, you know, otherwise, otherwise, you know, you're gonna go to hell, <laughs> basically, because she's quite experienced in this field, and she has uh, downed many people, many good, faithful people. Uh, many strong men, I, con I consider that as uh, uh, people with uh, good faith, have been slain by her. So, hey, uh, if you think that you know you are uh, immune to all this, hey, I, I, then watch out. Just like uh, what Brother uh, Luke said, this, that sexual urge is not is not that uh, easy to easy thing to repel, so to say. But likewise, that sort of strange women, strange doctrines, strange uh, uh, teachings, such as Catholic, Roman Catholic, you know, it's, it's going to get you if you keep at it, and you're going to suffer slow, slow death, and guess what? You'll be in hell if you keep on doing that. So, so you know, just watch out. Hearken. Hearken unto uh, the voice and, and the word of God. You know, attend to the word of God. All right, Brother Eric, uh, the final verses, 24 through 27. What's your reaction to that? My advice to all. Christian men is if you're struggling with this get you a wife and don't even think about having sex with other women hmm yeah, amen. That's what Paul told us. Um, maybe Bill can find that verse where Paul says that uh, uh, if you're going to burn with lust, then you need to get married and so that you have a, 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 um, a means of satisfying those desires. You need to do it within a marriage. Uh, he, he said if you, if, you, if you don't have that powerful sex drive, and if it's not a, 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 uh, um, controlling you, that then maybe you can Paul says maybe you can be like me and be unmarried and put go full time into the ministry, but remember if you do get married, then you have a, res a responsibility to your wife and your children, and some of your your program of your time needs to take care of them, so uh, you can't give as much time to ministry if you're married with children. Um, but Paul tells us that yeah. If, this is a powerful thing, and rather than letting the lust overtake you and you becoming a fornicator and adulterer, then you need to get married as as a means of uh, satisfying those those needs. Uh, but uh, so this is quite a warning here in the end, or or, or, or um, what's it called? Um, hearken, he says, hearken unto me. Uh, He's really appealing to us finally in the end here. Listen to these words. You understand how serious this is. That do not even begin the process of even entertaining these ideas because one thing leads to another, and then all of a sudden you're ensnared, and then it's going to cost you your life as you knew it. Uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty powerful. Lot like said at the end. Is it? pretty powerful verse you know the consequences of, of this sin whether it's spiritual or physical are, are pretty dire you know if, if you're a born again son of God you're a saint now you know those consequences will be physical you know they, that will be probably literal death that would be a sexually transmitted disease that would be all manner of things but if you're not a, a saint today and you go down that route you know the consequences are, are even more dire we're talking spiritual death here, and that is that is the worry, and that is you know why we, as Christians, you know, feel compelled to to, to try and relate God's wisdom to to the world, and, and you know, so you can get things sorted. You know, time is really short. You know, we're here, but vapor, James says, 
you know, 70, 80, 90 years if you're really lucky. You know, in that space of eternity, that is literally vaporous, nothing. So, you know, you know, listen to the wisdom of the Bible, listen to the wisdom of godly men, and, you know, if you're not saved now, get saved, please. All right. Um, has anybody had a chance to come on these final verses here? I don't recall. Before we close, uh, I, I think that it would be good to read the entire thing quickly in Amplified just to get the, um, so it's real easy to understand the whole thing in context here. I'll do that. I'd like to post it and have Bill read, but I can't. Bill, can you pull it up and amplify and read it on your own? Because if I post it in the comment section, it's too large. And, it, and, and the yeah, last I've, I've got it already. Yeah, I've got it already. Yeah, read it with your, with your dramatic Shakespearean English. Yeah, I wish, yeah, my, my Essex English. Right, so this is Proverbs chapter 7, Essex style in the amplified version. And it says, My son, keep my words. Lay up within you my commandments, or use them need, when needed, and treasure them. Keep my commandments and live, and keep my law and teaching as the apple, the pupil of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to skillful and godly wisdom, you are my sister, and regard understanding or insight as your intimate friend, that they may keep you from loose women, from the adventures who flatters and makes smooth words. For at the window of my house I looked out for the lattice, and among the simple, which is the empty-headed and empty-hearted ones, I perceived among the youths a young man, void of good sense, sauntering through the street near the loose woman's corner, and he went the way of her house. In the twilight, in the evening, night, black and dense was fallen over the young man's life. And behold, there met him a woman, dressed as a harlot, and sly and kind of heart. She is turbulent and willful, her feet stay not in her house. Now in the streets, now in the marketplaces, she sets her ambush at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. And with impudent face she said to him, Sacrifices of peace offerings were due from me. This day I paid my vows. So I come forth to meet you, that you might share with me the feast from my offering. Diligently I sought her face, and I found you. I have spread my couch, and rugs and cushions and tapestry, with striped sheets and fine linen from Egypt. I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us console and delight ourselves with love. For the man is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. It says at the full moon. Which, or with much justifying and enticing argument, she persuades him. With the allurements of her lips, she leads him to overcome his conscience and his fears and forces him along. Suddenly, he yields and follows her reluctantly like an ox moving to the slaughter, like one in fetters going to the correction, to be given to a fool or a like a dog enticed by food of the muzzle. So the dart of passion pierces and inflames his vials, then like a bird fluttering straight into the net, he hastens, not knowing that would have cost him his life. Listen to me, therefore, O you sons, and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart incline toward her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for he has cast down many wounded. Indeed, all her slain are mighty host. Her house is the way of shell, Hades the place of dead. Going down to the chambers of death. Well, I hope that uh, everybody can uh, take this to heart because it certainly uh, is not worth whatever 
pleasure you gain, the short and temporary, the, 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 the destruction it can have on your life in many ways. Um, well, we, we've talked about you know uh, dire consequences, um, and, and and now we want to talk about good news. So uh, it, it wouldn't make sense teaching people how to be wise and go through life with wisdom and have a successful life simply so they could die and go into the lake of fire. Uh, we want them to have a wonderful life, and then when they leave this world, move on to the next world in heaven with Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Uh, but how do you do that? What do they have to do? Do they have to follow commandments and become religious and, and, and uh, work their way to heaven by their own achievements, by their own performance? Brother Bill, is it possible for someone to get to heaven if they're just a good enough person? No, nope, absolutely not. The standard is set so high, it, it's humanly impossible to get to. You know that is that that is part of the the bad news that, that the world needs to hear. You know that, that 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 we can't even on our best day we fall so short of of God's glory it, it's embarrassing, and, and on our worst day we can see, you know what has happened. You know by reading the proverbs today. You know, we follow the lust of our own heart, our own desires, and, and we're seduced by all manner of things. You know, in today's society, we're seduced by pseudoscience or or, or fame or, or thinking that, you know, if we live a good life and we, we give money to charity that, you know, that, oh, we're going to get to heaven because we, we, we're so good and we're so kind. But it, it doesn't work like that. You know, that that is, that is very carnal in, in thinking that you know that's how the man thinks how we as human beings think that, that we can attain heaven we can attain eternal life or attain paradise just by being good or by being famous or by being intellectual and, and every single one of them is a no 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 to be honest there's only one way that, that, that people can go to heaven or receive eternal life and that is through Jesus Christ himself and to be honest, it's not even complicated. You know, it, it, it's you don't have to go through, you know, spiritual hoops or, or do spiritual somersaults to get to heaven. You know, that is man's effort, what we think we need to do. But in reality, all we need to do is, as and I love saying this so much, as, as someone who, who's never heard of, of this God, of someone who doesn't know about religion, who, who certainly didn't know about Jesus Christ. You know, he, he was in a prison. There was an earthquake. And it was shaken, and, and you know, if the prisoners escaped, and this time of day, you know, being you know in, in a Roman province, that this this particular person who was a a prison guard, you know, would be put to death. But thanks be to God that none of the prisoners escaped. You know, even though he was just about to kill himself, you yeah. know, the, the apostles, you know, they they you know, they was there, they didn't flee. And, and, and he said to them, you know, absolutely amazed that no one fled, you know, and amazed that he didn't have to actually kill himself. You know, he says, sirs, to them, he said, what must I do to be saved? You know, this is coming from just an average John on the street, if you want today's circumstances. You know, this is a secular person who knew nothing of God or religion or the Bible. And, the, and their answer was given clear and straightforward. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shall be saved. That is how simple it is to be saved. You know, we can't save ourselves. You know, the word says, you know, God Himself declares that all our righteousnesses, all the good things we do in our life, are as filthy rags under God. He's so holy and perfect, and we can never attain it ourselves. But thanks be, to, you know, God that He sent His Son Jesus Christ, who was the perfect one, who was the one who was righteous. And when we believe on this Jesus Christ, it's not our righteousness, it's not our good things that get us into heaven. It is Christ's good things, and it is Christ's righteousness which will get us into heaven. And that is the beauty of the gospel, the good news. It's so simple, but man has complicated it. Man is trying to become too intellectual. Man is trying to do all manner of things to think and persuade their own mind 
or their own devices that they can work their way to heaven. That can't be done. And the truth is really this, that Jesus Christ is the only way you can get into heaven. You know, it's the only way you can receive eternal life. And to be honest, is the most wise thing that anyone could do today. You know, if, if you're out there and, and you're, you're, you're intellectual or you're not intellectual, it doesn't matter. God is not a respectful person today. You know, he doesn't look at the outward appearance or, or how many good CVs you've got or if you've got diplomas or you're, you're a doctor of this or you're a scientist. He doesn't look at those things. God looks at the heart. And if you're honest with yourself today, whether you're intellect or not, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, if you're honest with yourself, you know there's something missing within your heart. This is if you don't know Christ that is. And that portion missing from your heart is God himself. You know, Emmanuel, God with us, God in us. And that is what mankind craves. And the only way we can receive this is just by faith, which is to trust and believe in this Jesus Christ of the Bible. It's not hard, it's not complicated. If you want the bare, bare basics today, all you really need to do to fill this void within your heart and to receive eternal life is to believe that Jesus Christ loves you dearly today, that he came to worth 2,000 years ago to make a payment for your shortfalls or your sins, that he was buried and he rose again the third day victorious being the first resurrection and know that all those who believe in him and trust in him will be resurrected as well they'll be risen with Christ it's really that simple so I pray today that you would cast aside your your so-called worldly you know wisdom or knowledge that you cast aside you know any pride cast aside any any thought or vain imagination that you could be good enough in yourself to get to heaven and just put your faith and trust in the only one, which is Jesus Christ, Son of God, that can and will take the heaven, if you believe me. So please, I pray, and employ today, believe on this Jesus, and be saved. All right, amen. Thank you, brother. Um, all right, so everybody watching this, uh, we certainly, uh, that's really the most important thing of every show is that we, we want to tell you this good news about Jesus and, and, and it's our hope and prayer that you will do as that Philippian jailer did, believe on Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Uh, he is worthy for, of your faith. Uh, you're justified in putting your faith in him because he is God. He became a man. He died for our sins. He raised himself from the dead. He did all that so that we can have confidence in believing in him, that he does have the power of life and death, and he's offering life everlasting to everyone right now. I've received it. All of us here have received this gift of eternal life. We didn't do anything to work for it or pay for it or earn it. We simply trusted Jesus. He did it all for us. Please put your faith in him now. Bless you all, uh, panelists. Uh, thank you for participating. And uh, I'm going to close the live broadcast. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.